where did civilization, in your opinion, begin? Oh, that's clear. Anybody that studies science, archaeology, or ancient history know that in the beginning was blackness. In the beginning was African people. We stood up first, spoke the first human truth, wrote the basic text uh, for human knowledge, introduced the basic disciplines of human knowledge. I mean, if you look in the Nile Valley civilization, and, and Egypt is in Africa, in spite of Liz Taylor and Richard Burton movies, <laughs> I mean, and in spite of Europe's attempt to deny that. And you put a lot of work into denying the African character of Egypt. First it took Africans out of Egypt, then Egypt out of Africa, and then Africans out of human history. And so what we have to do is return Egypt to African history so that as Diop said, Chekanta Diop, foremost uh, African Egyptologist said, that by that we reconcile human history and African history. We in the Nile Valley introduced some of the basic disciplines of human knowledge and contributed to them, science, medicine. The first doctor is an African, M. Hotel. First woman, first male, man doctor is an African, M. Hotel. The first woman doctor, Pesachet. The first uh, 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 mathematical text, the first medical text, all of it, the first literature, uh, the oldest spiritual text, the oldest ethical text, the first social justice text, the, the book of Kununu. All of this is African. And so we know that. People might say, well, what about Suma? Well, Suma was a small city state. And it was later. We're finding more and more, even recent discoveries, have taken Africa back in terms of early writing system further than we originally thought. And even then, it was anterior. Was Africa originally known uh, in prehistoric times as al land? Well, that's uh, some of the uh, scholars in black studies say that, but that's like Yoruba, and um, I'm not sure Africans thought of the continent as a whole unit. You see, Africa was like Asia and Europe. It didn't come into consciousness one day. What it was was a collection of ethnic groups nations and empires. It is the coming of the European, and just like Europe had to come to conscience of itself. First, they were Visigoths, Vikings. Nobody said, I'm a European. People said, I'm a Viking or Visigoth. You see, later on, when they posed themselves against the rest of the world, they became white men and Europeans. Before that, they were just tribesmen or whatever they wanted to call themselves, vandals and the rest of that. And then later on they got some other name, national name, then they moved into empire. Well, it's the same thing with Africa. First the ethnic group, the small ethnic group, then the nation, and then the empire. But it is our struggle against Europe that forged the African identity. It is in struggling against Europe to reassert our humanity, to reassert our right to understand ourselves and introduce ourselves to history and humanity as bearers of dignity and divinity with the right to freedom, the right to justice, the right to equality, the right to the fruit of the world. That is when we became Africans. What uh, if, uh, assuming uh, everything you say is correct, if all of those great achievements uh, were made by Africans, what happened? How did uh, Europeans conquer people that great? I teach, I teach a class, Introduction to Black Studies, and one of the central questions I seek to answer in my book, the third edition, which is the most widely used uh, introductory text, is that very same question. It's a good question. It's a legitimate question. Well, there are several reasons uh, for that. And first, we have to put it in context. First of all, Europe did not overcome Africa all at once. When Europe came up and was new, Africa was already old. Okay? Second, all civilizations decline. Where is Rome? What is Rome but ruins now? What is Greece now but a memory? Okay? Let's, let's face it. All these civilizations rise and decline. So why wouldn't Africa rise and decline? Okay? So we have to see that. The next thing is that you have these reasons. First, Europe's eventually technological advantage. See, Europe had an advantage. It, in, in the turning point, it's 1492, when the Africans, the Moors, the Afro-Asians are defeated in Spain, in Moorish Spain, and Ferdinand and them get enough money to begin to go around the world to collect and borrow technique and to synthesize it and turn it into an advantage before they are not above Africa. In fact, uh, in uh, the 10 hundreds, like about 1066, uh, when William conquered, uh, William the, uh, the Norman conquered England, he had 15,000 men. At that same time, Tunkamenon had uh, 100,000 people, 30 of them were bowmen. So they were far out, um, uh, they had greater technology and greater military capacity than Europe at that time. But 
What happens, you have this decline, and Europe gains what we call hegemony in the world through this collection of technique and borrowing from everybody and then putting its stamp on. Second, the economic advantage, eventual. All of this is the e economic adventure. The economic is based on two or three things. The maps they inherited from the Islamic civilization, which was the greatest civilization at that time. Also the shipbuilding uh, and uh, gunpowder and guns uh, gave them a chance to disrupt our economy and make us dependent on them. And they outstripped us. They were able then to cause culture and economic arrest in Africa because they turned Africa into consumers rather than producers. And the technique and the scientific initiative is lost, but also enslavement, which cleared the land interrupted scientific and technological progress, inter interrupted culture development, and again, created what we call now underdevelopment. Europe underdeveloped us. I'll give you an example of it in modern times when the Congo got its independence in the 60s. There were 14 million people, and Belgium had seen to it that there were only 14 college graduates out of that 14 million. That's called structured underdevelopment, so that Africa could never compete with Europe, never be another Taiwan or Singapore or eventually China or Japan. Do you feel you have gotten your just rewards for creating Kwanzaa? Well, if you mean economically, of course not, but I have gotten an award. One of the most beautiful things about my life, and I, I feel blessed about this, is I've seen my work flourish in my own lifetime. Uh, this is a very important thing to see, not only Kwanzaa, but the intellectual uh, philosophy of Kawaida that I created uh, flourish in the organizational forms uh, that I create flourish. Uh, that's a very important thing. Malcolm wasn't able to do that. Garvey, Fannie Lou Hamer wasn't able to uh, see that. Uh, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth wasn't able to see that. So I've seen this in my lifetime and I've seen it affect not only African Americans, but Africans in the Caribbean, Africans in Africa, Africans in uh, Asia, Africans in Europe, all over the world. So I feel good about that and I, I, I'm very appreciative not only to my organization, US, uh, which is, gives me all kinds of intellectual uh, and political support for what I'm doing, uh, but also my friends and my family uh, and all those people who embrace uh, the concept uh, taught to us in the Odu Ifa, the classical text of uh, Yoruba culture that says we are chosen divinely to bring good into the world, and that is the fundamental mission and meaning of human life, and I have tried to bring good into the world. In uh, five seconds, if you can, is black studies overall going in the right direction? Yes, black studies overall is going in the wrong, uh, in the right direction. What I really wanted to do is to go back to its original forces, uh, uh, position even more, and remember to always link campus with community and to use knowledge to improve the human condition and enhance the human future. On that note, I thank you, sir. Thank you.